Welcome to the Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing. We've got a great show for you today. I'm speaking with Fred Thiel, CEO of Marathon Digital, one of the large publicly traded Bitcoin miners. Fred, welcome to Real Vision. Great to be here. So much to talk about. We're talking a little bit off uh, camera about what's happening right now in the mining space, energy, Bitcoin. A big picture, where is the mining business today? So uh, Bitcoin mining is uh, growing and expanding. You know, the way to measure that is just look at the global hash rate. Global hash rate is up about 23% year to date, uh, which means more miners are plugging uh, miners in to take advantage of kind of the uptick in the price of Bitcoin uh, that's happened since the beginning of the year. I think you know, Bitcoin's up over 70 plus percent since the beginning of the year, one of the best performing assets out there, even from a risk adjusted basis. So, you know, supply of hash rate always lags price uh, of Bitcoin by a few months. And so we're starting to see, uh, you know, that come online, you know, ourselves marathon, we're growing our capacity about threefold over where we ended last year by middle of this year. So it gives you a feel for kind of the, the amount of growth we're putting in place. Um, and then you're seeing a lot of expansion offshore, a lot of uh, mining going on in other countries outside the US that's coming online now as well. And then next year, around uh, this time frame, we have uh, the halving, where the rewards that Bitcoin miners receive will be um, chopped by 50%, which happens every four years. And so, uh, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens as Bitcoin price continues to appreciate, uh, or if it stays where it is today, and the impact of that on the industry. But uh, you know, we're very excited, certainly, about what we're up to and what the industry is doing, uh, even though there's some headwinds. Uh, in the news from the regulatory perspective and just uh you know obviously capital markets being quite constrained for those of uh you know those in the industry that need to tap the capital markets to grow which luckily we don't have to do at this point so yeah and some additional uh environmental concerns we'll talk about all that in just one moment uh but you mentioned price and i wanted to bring this up a uh, bitcoin up 75 percent on a year-to-date basis on a trailing 12-month basis a uh, down nearly 27 percent obviously a volatile asset uh some movement to the upside here that we've seen recently give us a little bit of the context on how you guys think about price sure so if you look back historically the price of bitcoin goes through kind of two years of growth, two years of declines. And I'm being very general uh, now. There are obviously lots of spikes and dips in between. Um, but the price of Bitcoin essentially uh, goes in this four-year cycle. Uh, typically, if you go back over prior cycles, you'll see that um, about six months after a halving event, again, the halving, uh, next halving event is in May, uh, Bitcoin price reaches a peak, which would be kind of December of next year. And then it does a slow decline down, uh, reaches a bottom about uh, 36 months kind of through the cycle, and then it turns around and goes back up again. Um, that's the historical pattern, and I'm not necessarily saying that the pattern will repeat itself, but it has repeated itself three times exactly this way uh, in the prior three uh, having events. So our perspective um, is we typically develop kind of three scenarios, bear, base, bull, where we think the price of Bitcoin and the global hash rate are going to be. Because in our business, global hash rate is critical to understand because that drives our productivity, if you would. And the more miners that are hashing, uh, the harder it is for us to win a block, the harder it is for get that block reward. Um, for, for, the, for those so, who may not know, just this a little bit of background here. This is the aggregate computational capacity online at any given time. Uh, and obviously, there's a free market uh, in this. So it's a it's a supply and demand issue. Talk a little bit about that and why it's so critical to understanding the mining business. Sure. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, and I think we take it for granted sometimes just because we're in the midst of it all. Um, so think of it as there is a fixed number of Bitcoin that can be awarded today. And today, that's 900 Bitcoin. At the halving, it'll be 450 a day. And all the miners globally are contributing hash power. Think of it as just compute power to solving um, essentially the puzzle that we try and solve. And if we solve that puzzle successfully, then we get to mint a block and we get the block reward. There are a little over 2,000 blocks awarded a day. So that 900 Bitcoin per day pays out about six and a quarter uh, Bitcoin per block. Uh, and in theory, a block is meant to happen every 10 minutes. And that's the way the software for Bitcoin blockchain is written. And to maintain that consistent speed, 
If more compute power comes online, which means the problems are being solved faster, then it makes the problem more difficult so that that 10 minute interval is maintained. And uh, again, if you double the number of people competing for that 900 Bitcoin, it gets twice as hard. And so each miner has to work twice as hard to get the same amount of Bitcoin block rewards. So that's how that works. It's kind of a zero sum game, unlike oil or gold, where somebody can sit on reserves and determine I'm gonna extract more or less based on price in the market. We are constantly fighting over this fixed number of Bitcoin so that uh, you go through a period like when the global hash rate uh, dropped dramatically because China prohibited mining and all the miners in China had to shut down then what effectively happened was the hash rate dropped by half almost. And so Bitcoin miners were, were rewarded accordingly. And then we, uh, you know, I think you guys are showing a chart now that shows kind of the hash rate. And then we returned to kind of the, um, the trend line. Um, but, you know, Bitcoin hash rate continues to grow right now uh, and as miners put on more capacity. And, um, it, you know, it gets more difficult with each, uh, each difficulty adjustment, um, but you know, it, sometimes it's adjusted downwards. And we had earlier this year, a, a downward adjustment, for example, when um, the price of Bitcoin was low, so. Yeah, it, it's such an important, I'm so glad you were able to describe that, Fred, because it really is important for people to understand the supply and demand and the financial and economic dynamics of this business, because it determines so much in terms of the capacity that gets put online and the profitability of mining. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, a, go ahead, please. No, go ahead. So let's talk a little bit uh, about something that you've been intimately involved with, which is what's happening right now in regulation. Uh, I know that you were down on the Hill talking to some folks and briefing them about what's happening. Where are we right now in this process of, uh, you know, oversight from Congress uh, and the potential legislation we may, hopefully, but may see in the future? Well, I think while last year before FTX, Three Arrows Capital, Celsius Mining, et cetera, happened, uh, lawmakers were generally speaking open to learning about crypto, uh, how it could help, you know, where were their risks, et cetera, and were working with many of the crypto firms to kind of understand things and move things forward. Um, and while the, the SEC hasn't really changed their tune, um, uh, you know, they've always been kind of uh, come speak to us and we may or may not decide to let you do what you're going to do. Um, what happened post FTX uh, and these other crashes is that basically the tone went to consumers have been harmed, therefore we need to regulate this industry. But because no lawmakers are willing to, um, you know, really a handful of, of lawmakers have put forward bills, but there's not enough traction, I think, at the moment in Washington to get those bills passed. And so we're in an environment where we don't have a regulatory framework where companies can operate. And generally speaking, the regulators are anti uh crypto and digital assets uh you know bitcoin mining sits in its own little niche a little bit because while bitcoin has been deemed a commodity by both the sec and the cftc and even the irs because we pay taxes on it um it, the issues around bitcoin mining tend to be more related to climate and uh and energy politics and so it requires a lot of education from our side to educate people just like we spoke about the global hash rate and understanding the dynamics of global hash rate, we have to also educate lawmakers and their staffs, more importantly, about the energy and the climate uh, aspects of Bitcoin mining and how Bitcoin mining actually contributes to grid stability and how it contributes to lowering the cost of renewable energy to consumers and contributes to the growth of renewable energy in this country, which without baseload offtake customers like Bitcoin mining, there would be little incentive for outside of government incentives. And you know, if you want, I'm happy to riff yeah. about what's called the duck curve and how energy markets work so that people can understand about that. Um, but essentially, we're just doing a lot of education uh, on Capitol Hill, yeah. talking to staffers uh, and helping them kind of understand. And you know, winning over some people who uh, maybe were sitting on the fence before, now that they have a better understanding, um, you know, are, are forming more informed opinions. And you know, that's what we're really trying to do is we want lawmakers to have informed opinions, not opinions based on stuff that's printed in the New York Times or that's inflammatory in nature that where they don't have the benefit of hearing the counter argument.
Yeah, we're going to talk uh, in just a second about that New York Times article, but let's dive deep on exactly that, exactly those points you just made. Tell us a little bit about how the Bitcoin mining business works in terms of energy. I think it's probably counterintuitive for some people to understand this idea uh, that by uh, by consuming energy to do Bitcoin mining, there are some potential benefits to that. Talk big picture, and let's start at the very yep. beginning for people who may not understand sure. this or just haven't had the opportunity to hear this conversation before. Let's explain that issue. Sure. So if you look at the energy markets, uh, for one thing, the amount of electrical energy that's generated in this country, it's not a zero-sum game, meaning if one person consumes electricity it's not that that electricity is now not a, you know, electricity won't be available to somebody else. Uh, so we actually generate and have capacity to generate much more electricity in this country than is consumed. Start there. The other thing is the grid, which is the transmission, the transmission mechanism that sends electricity from a power generator to your home and the plug in your wall, it cannot store energy. It's a plumbing. So just like plumbing, it can only hold as much water, in this case, electrons, as is being pulled or demanded or consumed by consumers. So what the grid does is it signals to the generators, hey, turn on more capacity because consumers need more electricity or turn off capacity because demand is dropping. Now, what most people, and this is where most people really don't have a proper understanding of this, is that demand during the day and night changes fairly dramatically during certain periods of the day. And so the grid's challenge is how do I balance demand and supply? This is what so, economists call a peak load problem, the challenge that you have exactly. loads that are very much higher at one period uh, and much lower at another. How do you balance that out? Exactly. So the, the issue uh, with load balancing, as it's called, um, is that um, essentially there isn't a very um, the typical pattern during the day is that you know people get up in the morning around 9 a.m there's a small peak because people are making breakfast they turn on the heat they turn on a washing machine they're consuming energy then they go to work demand drops and there's this what they call the duck curve think of the shape of the bottom silhouette of a duck you have the tail here little peak where the tail is then you have the belly of the duck which is a dip and then up to the belt the nib in the mouth up at the top in the morning you have the little tail peak then it dips into the belly and then it goes up into the kind of really peak load during the day which is 4 p.m to 9 p.m during the day that's peak demand that's when people are turning on ac turning on heat etc so now you've got this energy that's needed and you have different types of energy that are generated some types of energy that are generated you can regulate up and down other ones you can't so at the bottom of the energy pyramid is nuclear why is it at the bottom well you can't take tell a nuclear power plant i need 40 percent more power i need 30 percent less power it doesn't work that way it takes a long time for the nuclear power plant to react and so they put that at the bottom where there will be guaranteed demand so that all of the energy generated by nuclear power plants gets sucked up first the layer above that is coal and why is coal the next layer? Well, coal, you can turn up and down just a little, but it takes hours, if not days, for that response in demand to happen. And so coal is the next layer. Then comes natural gas. Why natural gas? Well, natural gas, or what they call peaker plants, is a type of power where you can turn it on, and in 30 or 40 minutes, it comes online, and then when demand has slackened, it can be shut off and then it doesn't have to cool down like a boiler does in the traditional kind of coal world. And then only comes solar and wind and other renewable forms, um, which are intermittent. Why are they intermittent? Well, the sun shines from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Go back to that duck curve I talked about. The dip from 9 a.m. to kind of 3 p.m. is when the least demand is there. So what happens? The grid operators say, OK, I don't have peak demand. I need to start shutting off supply. And they go from the top down in that pyramid. They shut off wind, they shut off solar, then they shut off natural gas, and then they keep coal and nuclear running as base load. So what ends up happening is when solar is most productive is when they have the hardest time to sell it because there's the least demand in the market. And that causes solar energy to be negatively priced during parts of the day. In Texas, up to 20% of the day, solar and wind energy can be negatively priced, meaning the generator pays people to take it. 
The other challenge we have is that as we bring on more renewable energy, that renewable energy is just competing for that little peak of the pyramid, which only is in demand during peak power times. And so how do you get somebody who can only sell energy a few hours of the day to be profitable if they're typically being shut off or curtailed? And so a Bitcoin miner can step into the picture and they can work with a renewable energy provider and say, we'll take all the excess energy you produce and that will give you a base level of revenue. So now you're getting a return on your investment in this renewable energy generation uh, project and you can charge the consumer less money because most of these marketplaces are bidding marketplaces where they have to, the generator has to bid against the demand side um, for uh, to make the energy market work, so to say. And so by having a baseload customer like us, the renewable guy can lower their prices in bids, which means they may win more of that bids, which makes them overall more profitable and the consumer gets more renewable mix in the pipeline. In the US today, we have almost a two year backlog between renewable energy coming online and available transmission lines. So what that means is, you know, you're adding all this generating capacity, but you can't get it to the consumers because power lines don't have the capacity to transport it because most solar and wind is built where people aren't because that's where you have cheap land. That's where you have access to good wind. It's where you have access to good solar, like West Texas. Yet 70% of the population of Texas is in the eastern part of the state. You can only transmit electricity about 600 miles before you lose so much power in the transmission line that it becomes inefficient. And by the way, in this country, we lose anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of the electricity generated just in transmission line inefficiencies. So let's look at how much energy does Bitcoin mining use? Globally, Bitcoin mining uses less than a fraction of one percent of the available electricity that's generated. Less than a fraction of one percent. Now, Bitcoin mining uses about a quarter of the energy that ATMs use in the US, right? Cash is something that's going out of style last I heard. People are paying with things on their cell phones. Yet we still pay to have all these ATMs running all over the place. Bitcoin mining uses less energy than holiday lights do in the US. Bitcoin mining uses less energy than video game consoles. Bitcoin mining uses less energy than all the streaming service providers data centers use. Yet people deem that Bitcoin mining is a waste of resources. So I think, you know, people really need to educate themselves, understand the nature of how the energy markets work, realize how we help load balance the grid, because when the grid needs quickly um, 200 megawatts, Bitcoin miners in Texas can shed that load in 10 minutes and have all that energy available to the general public. And then when there's too much energy being generated, we can start our systems up again in very short period of time and run. So we are this perfect interruptible load that can load shed immediately, uh, essentially in, from a grid parlance. Uh, and then we can bring up our demand again so that the energy generators again have an opportunity to generate um, you know, revenues and cash flows when the demand side of the marketplace uh, doesn't call for it. So we act as this great balancer of the grid um, that overall is helping fund more renewable energy and overall helping decrease the cost of electricity to consumers. It doesn't mean that we're causing more fossil fuel to come online because energy is not a zero sum game. There is plenty of energy generation capacity and our industry predominantly selects renewable energy. We are, as an industry, over 50% fueled by renewable energy. No other industry in the U.S. does that. The average, you know, the U.S. grid, by the way, is only 25, 26% renewable anyway. Mm. So as an industry, you know, we are the most environmentally friendly. We don't generate CO2 emissions by our operations and we're using renewable energy. So I, I think you know, people really need to be educated and understand this, um, to understand the benefit Bitcoin mining brings to the grid and balancing it and making it operate more efficiently. A true deep dive there on the nature of mining. And I think some of the aspects of the grid uh, and power generation here in the United States that people may not have been aware of. A lot of facts 
thank you for sharing that perspective. I want to open this up to our viewers right now. Uh, come and join the conversation. Put your questions down in the chat. Wherever you're watching, we're going to ask the best ones on the air. Remember, Real Vision members take priority, but the good news is membership is free. Go to realvision.com forward slash crypto to sign up. That's realvision.com forward slash crypto to sign up. And by the way, I should say, as you just heard from that last answer there, an incredible amount of detail about the way not just Bitcoin mining works, but also the power grid and electricity generation here on the United States. Real Vision is absolutely committed to keeping this content free to you. So if you're watching on YouTube, please tweet this link out. You can always follow me as well at Ash Bennington on Twitter. And of course, follow Real Vision at Real Vision on Twitter. Fred, a really detailed information uh, dump there. So much to talk about. Uh, I'm pretty surprised actually to hear that ATMs use more capacity uh, than uh, than Bitcoin money. That's a pretty striking statistic, particularly when you think about the relative role and the importance uh, of the sort of the future uh, of the financial system. And according to those of us who are passionate about this technology, uh, versus the past. I mean, bit, uh, ATMs are clearly going the way of the dodo bird as things become uh, much more uh, digital in their transfers. Talk a little bit more about that absolute capacity number because it's a striking one. Yeah, so you know, if you think about it, uh, ATMs have to be on 24-7, 365. Uh, banks do not um, you know, make it a priority to identify uh, renewable energy sources for those ATMs. You know, most ATMs are just plugged into whatever supply of energy is being provided to a bank branch. And um, you know, I haven't seen any bank ESG reporting because that hasn't really become mandatory quite yet, but I'm sure the regulators will make that mandatory at some point here. And it'll become quite evident that you know the the energy mix that banks use, uh, you know, is most probably predominantly carbon based as opposed to renewable. Um, so you know, it's an area I think that it's important that if you know we're going to highlight one industry's energy use, let's look at everybody's energy use. You know, at least make it an even playing field and. While you're looking at just data centers and Bitcoin mining operations are really just data centers, um, you know, look at the data center industry as a whole. Look at how much you know these uh, you know large learning models that we're now starting to use for Chat GPT and AI and things like that. Educating and teaching those models, building those models, uses a huge amount of compute power, also, which uses a lot of energy. You know, 25 percent of the capacity of the internet. The bandwidth of the internet is consumed by streaming services. We don't talk about that either, right? The internet's meant to be free, yet these streaming services use the majority of the energy of the bandwidth uh, of the internet. So I, I think consumers need to become educated about these things. And unfortunately, the lack of that education makes them very susceptible to uh, questionable uh, practices by the media and reporting on the industry. Uh, talking of which, one of the things that you mentioned earlier in the show is the New York Times article. Uh, I read it uh, when it came out, and I was really struck uh, by the fact that, listen, the article, if you haven't read the article yet, it literally begins with 40 people freezing to death in Texas during a storm and then trans transitions immediately into Bitcoin mining, implying a causal connection between the two. Uh, it was really... Um, well, let's just say it was quite striking to me when I read that article. Some thoughts about it, uh, Fred, and the implications uh, for, you know, this kind of information flow. So I think, you know, I would deem this as a hit piece, as we call it, um, where it was very specific in its agenda. Uh, the New York Times did not speak to us in preparing for this article. So had they done that, we would have shared our perspective. Um, I believe some of our colleagues in the industry, Riot Platforms, has commented extensively, rebutting a lot of the points the New York Times made, and you can find that on their website. They have a detailed rebuttal there. Uh, it's also generally available on Twitter. Um, but essentially, uh, the New York Times conveniently uh, forgot to do the energy discussion about the energy pyramid I went through. They conveniently forgot to mention the fact that energy is not a zero-sum game and they conveniently forgot to look at the benefits that ERCOT in Texas has seen and conveniently it's forgot Air to Cot mention that is the Texas grid. There are three grids in the United States uh, for electrical transmission. There's the East grid, the West grid and ERCOT, which is the Texas grid. They have their own. Yep, correct. So in Texas is unique in that it's an unregulated market. So it's a free marketplace where bidders uh, who have supply generators can bid against demand and, and uh, match that. So it's a very uh, it's, it's a fabulous grid because of that. Now, 
you know, winter storm Ian, where uh, Texas had the great freeze, where they had, uh, you know, homes, water pipes burst and all that. Uh, you know, when you look at that, the core driver of a lot of that problem was a the Texas grid at the time was not connected to the broader grid infrastructure in the US. Um, and more importantly, uh, a lot of the infrastructure that froze was not necessarily power generating, it was things like gas pipelines. So even though the gas uh, you know, power plants were there and ready to go. The pipeline was frozen and they couldn't get it. So fast forward to um, the winter storms that happened last year. Um, now, all of a sudden, ERCOT had the ability to curtail a lot of Bitcoin miners because a lot of capacity had come online last year. All that curtailment resulted in the fact that they did not have to shut off electricity to consumers. They did not have to cause brownouts. Uh, and you didn't have any of these disasters because there was more than ample power available because Bitcoin miners voluntarily shut down their systems based on demand signals from America. More importantly, a number of us voluntarily shut down in advance of the storm so that ERCOT would have the energy capacity buffer ready without having to send a curtailment signal. So this industry does a lot to balance the grid. And I think, um, again, it gets back to education. And I think the New York Times piece was very motivated, whether it was political or just um, based on the principles of the publishers, um, to paint the Bitcoin mining industry as this uh, machine that just consumes endless amounts of energy. And it, by the way, it wasn't long ago the World Economic Forum published a paper that said Bitcoin mining industry would consume more energy than the world produces by the mid, the mid 2020s. Here we are in 2023. We still consume less than a fraction of 1% of the energy that's generated. And oh, by the way, we're becoming more and more energy efficient every month. For example, our fleet of miners uh, has an average uh, energy efficiency in the low to mid 20s of joules per terahash. Think of it as kind of watts per compute power entity. Uh, terahash is just a measure of compute power, um, right. where the overall industry is in the mid 40s, which is still very uh, you know, generally efficient, but you right. know, we're very focused at being the most energy efficient miner out there because we think over time the amount of energy our industry will consume will decrease because we're going to become much more efficient. Sorry. Let me jump in uh, and ask some of these viewer questions. Uh, Roger actually is interested in exactly this topic. Uh, Roger wants to know: Is Fred saying Marathon is 100% green energy? Uh, and this is coming from uh, Fred from the Real Vision website. Sure. So uh, we operate, uh, the bulk of our capacity is uh, behind the meter at wind farms or adjacent to wind farms. So we're primarily taking wind energy for as long as that wind energy is available. So um, in West Texas, for example, we have a facility, King Mountain, um, and uh, we essentially sit co-located on the wind farm. You can see videos of it on our website if you want, but you see the windmills and you see our mining facility right below it. So we're taking that wind energy that they otherwise aren't selling to the grid and using that to run our operations. And then when um, the wind is not blowing, we will procure energy from the grid, which we fully offset with what are called RECs, which are renewable energy credits. And what RECs do is essentially, um, if you have generated electricity using renewable means, you get a renewable energy credit and you can use one of those to offset energy you buy that isn't. And uh, so the grid mix in Texas as some component of fossil and nuclear, and then the bulk of it is renewable. So we're generally using either our wind energy or we're buying energy off the Texas grid and then offsetting any fossil components. So we're fully carbon neutral in our operations in that regard. In North Dakota, we sit adjacent to a wind farm. We take predominantly wind energy, um, though it comes via the grid. And any um, non-renewable uh, uh, that we take, we offset again with Rex. So it's offset by RECs and you get to 100% carbon neutrality that way. Any mm -hmm. uh, sense uh, of terms of the percentage of what the actual organic uh, generation from true renewables is, not including the offsets from credits? Yeah, it's uh, about, uh, and this is a little back of the envelope uh, estimate, a little over 54%. So it is in fact a majority. Yeah. Roger also wants to know, uh, do B green bitcoins command any kind of premium on the market? That's an interesting question, and for a fungible good. Yeah, the the challenge with that is um, 
A green Bitcoin is only green as long as it has never left the uh, miner's wallet if the miner mined it using fully green energy. The minute, you know, um, so here's kind of a way to think about it, that, um, you know, your Bitcoin wallet holds a ledger amount. It doesn't hold physical Bitcoins, right? So if you're right. in your wallet, you're going to have a balance, just like in your checking account. If you were to go to your bank and say, I want to know the serial numbers for every dollar bill that's in my bank account, they would say we can't because there are no dollar bills actually in your bank account. It's a ledger entry. Right. Same thing applies to Bitcoin. So the challenge is, even though I might mine a Bitcoin, the minute I transfer it somewhere, there is no serial number on that Bitcoin. Therefore, it is no right. longer green. It's now right. part of the mix. Because we got a couple more questions that I want to hit yeah. because there's some good ones from our viewers. Uh, the first ones come to us from Ralph on the Real Vision website. Uh, Ralph wants to know two questions. Is Marathon involved with or doesn't mine other protocols? That's number one. Number two, what happens to the mining business after Bitcoin reaches 21 million? Great question. So answer to the first question is no, we only mine Bitcoin. And the second question is, it's not until 2140, which is over 100 years from now, when the last Bitcoin will be mined, though we've mined about 19.3 million Bitcoin to date. Um, there are still uh, obviously a uh, little under 2 million Bitcoin left to be mined. And that's driven by this halving process that every four years, half as many Bitcoin are awarded. And so today it's 900 next year this time or in may of next year it'll be 450 and then 2028 it'll be half of that etc right I, I know we're out of time here but i wanted to ask this uh, last question from gary from the real vision website because it's such a great question gary wants to know does marathon have a plan on how to make uh this energy use uh, uh, energy use education in other words uh, what he's asking is do you have a plan for how to educate people about uh, how the energy industry works. I mean, I think it would be great to have more open debate on this. I think environmentalists who dislike Bitcoin should come to the table and explain their case. I think that Bitcoin miners, uh, such as yourself, who have this perspective, should go out there and show some uh, data. And one of the things that's so challenging about it is most people just seem so completely in the dark about the way this process works. Do you guys at Marathon, the question from Gary, have a plan for how to do more in terms of energy education? Absolutely. So. We're focused on a number of different avenues. The first is funding academic research um, in the space around the energy use. Why are we funding academic as opposed to just publishing the data ourselves? Well, the theory is that if we publish it ourselves, which we intend to do still, um, but it would be put in question possibly as being biased because we're the ones publishing it. So therefore, we're going to fund academic research into the space and let them form their own opinions. Um, the other is working with uh, energy companies uh, and working with uh, ideally um, the general members of the general public that have an interest in this in really educating people about energy. This country has a need to educate itself on energy well beyond the Bitcoin mining industry. If we're yeah. going to a world with electric vehicles who are, by the way, generate much more carbon <laughs> than, than the Bitcoin mining industry does when you think about the amount of electricity they're going to use. As that fleet gets to be 25, 30, 40 percent of the vehicle fleet in this country, we need energy infrastructure that is able to be balanced and that is able to be interrupted. And we're going to need more capacity of the services that Bitcoin miners provide to the grid than we have today, because otherwise you're not going to find a place to fuel your EV vehicle in the middle of the country. The other thing is. There's a move to move from natural gas heating and cooking. Uh, you know, California's passing rules about that. The state of New York and the city of New York are passing rules about that. And again, there is going to be more and more load on the infrastructure of the grid. And we need to build out that infrastructure. You know, again, we're behind in infrastructure for transmission versus generation. And so we're going to educate. We're hoping the power industry will educate people so that the voting public can understand and vote with knowledge versus voting with hearsay. Fred Thiel, fantastic conversation. I learned a great deal from this. I hope you'll come back and join us again soon. Absolutely. Anytime. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great weekend.